Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures, and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. Lori Maison wants to start a leadership revolution, and she wants you to be part of it. Lori, are you a troublemaker? What's happening here? What's wrong with our leaders? <laughs> Funny, I am kind of a good troublemaker. That's uh, actually fairly accurate. Okay, it's good you you warned us, but let's be fair now. <laughs> what what's wrong with our leaders today? We we hear so many. There's so many books about them. We keep hearing them on TV. Uh, obviously, seeing them in different capacities. What is the specific thing you find that's incorrect about what they're doing? Yeah, you know, we are still using the uh, approaches and thinking and methodologies from the last century to develop leaders in this century and the workplace has fundamentally changed organizations have fundamentally changed and leaders need to fundamentally change and yet we're still developing like it's 1989 well i'm guessing that i mean as i picture a leader most times they're a person, I don't want to say old, but older because they've gone through the ranks, either through schooling, through experience, through being an author, a professor, or something else. And now they're moving up the chain. As they get up there, they're, they've learned their trade maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, maybe more, maybe yes. a little less. So it would seem natural that they're going to carry over some of these things. But of course, in the world we're living in today, everything is so quick. And if I'm correct, you actually coach the top, top leaders in the world, yep. how to do things better and to get over these humps. Yeah, Well, and to think about their leadership differently than they did in the last century. And it's a little like, you know, what they learned coming up in an organization no longer applies. The, the work environment is so different, so much more diversity, so many more ways companies op operate, you know, remote, hybrid, in the office, you know, now there's like six generations in the workplace versus two generations in 1970. You add technology in there and new tools and you have just a pretty exceptionally different environment than when these leaders started their careers. And I guess you have more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, more informed workers and employees. So they know <laughs> yeah, if they're not happy with it, they can simply jump or if, if it's a matter of money. Right. And they're more, de the workers are more demanding now. They, you know, they're more vocal about their needs and the length of retention at an organization for an employee, not a leader, it's less than three years. So it used to be 20 years or 25 years. Like when I started my career, companies hired right out of people schooling and kept their employees through retirement. Now, you know, if an employee stays three years, you're pretty lucky. No, it, definitely so. And and that's it, it's much lower than I thought when you said three. I would have said maybe five or six would probably be the average. But I guess when you start for averaging leader, out for a, leader, for a leader, it's more four to five years. But for an employee, it's actually less than three years. It's like 2.7 years, something like that. Now, one of the things I saw in your book, you say you ask, what are we trying to do here? What changes do we wish or need to have happen? What kind of answers do you get from the leaders? What do, do they know what they need or do you have to find it? Sometimes they know what they need, but often we have to help them explore that. Um, what they think they want is not actually what they want. And as an individual, that's often true as well. We think we want a new car, but what we really need is, you know, transportation that's reliable, that gets us somewhere. Part of coaching is helping people understand their underlying needs and then make sure they have the programs in place that help them meet those needs. Now, can you give us just a simple example of what a leader might say to you? Uh, are they asking you, I want the stock value to go up, I want to be more profitable, I want to be more popular with the employees? What kind of direction do they go in when they contact yeah, you? Yeah, they usually want employees to be more committed, more loyal, because loyalty is uh, kind of a lost art these days, and they want them to be more productive. 
um, which was really interesting. That one was really interesting during the pandemic because the following the pandemic, many leaders said they wanted people back in the office. And when asked why, they said they wanted them to be more productive. But a lot of research showed that people were the most productive when they were actually working at home. The percentage of production went up fairly dramatically, especially in the early parts of the pandemic. Sometimes there, you know, the solution I want people back in the office is not really the solution to I want people to be more productive. Now, do you actually or or do you go behind the scenes, so to speak, and uh, let's say the leader says, I want this. But when you talk to the employees, maybe it's they're both seeing a totally different picture and you're nodding yes. So I can see there's an interesting answer coming up. Yeah, yeah, that's often the case. And uh, we call this perception or perspective, like the leader will have like one point of view in what's happening. But if you go check with other people around that leader, whether it's a direct report, a peer, or even someone above them, they often have a very different perspective. And so one of the things the leader has to learn is to go beyond their own perspective, like, sure, that's good, but what are the other people thinking? And then to learn how to do some perception management and make sure that they're communicating in a way that creates a common way of thinking between their employees their peers, their boss, and themselves. When the leader is thinking one thing and everyone around them is thinking something else, you you have a lack of alignment that causes so many problems. And, and I would guess that's uh, almost, uh, it sounds like a new job uh, position, but an alignment expert would be another term for what you're doing because having gone through yes. your book, you've got to tie in both the employees the stockholders, the customers, and the boss, the leader. And the leader. And it, it is rather shocking when you go and hear all those points of view and they're so diverging. You're like, wow, you know, how is this actually functional? And sometimes it's not that functional. <laughs> can you give us, a, it can be simplified uh, just for an example, but maybe a company you recently worked with where uh, what might be called a typical problem was coming up that you see maybe more than uh, once a year or so? Mm, I mean, there's kind of a standard series of problems. Of course, <laughs> I, I couldn't name an actual company. No, no, we don't want names. Outing them a bit, right? but I would say definitely always employee productivity, this new one about employee loyalty, that people actually stay at the company longer than a short amount of time, because you might imagine um, the cost of the company when the in- employee base turns over every two or three years. That's that's a huge cost for the company. I think another thing is uh, employee appreciation, where you know often people provide some different kinds of benefits that are helpful, but when it comes right down to it, employees actually want their boss to notice them and support them and give them some acknowledgement. And you generally, you know, the biggest complaint is about managers. You know, my manager is always the biggest problem. So management training, you know, how to work with people in a way that realizes their potential versus just demands, you know, tasks and outcomes from them. Has your solutions and what you're seeing changed? I'm going to say in the last five years, but that would include a little bit before and I guess throughout the pandemic. And now afterward, we seem to have come out of that and we're going about life as we did before. But did that change things and the the reaction? Oh, yes, for sure. Uh, it changed it dramatically from um, in person to virtual, and then just a, a dramatic increase in, in technolo- technological tools. So now you have a workforce, some of whom are at home, some of whom are in the office. Um, Some of them are going back and forth. And now you have to have new ways to track all of these things that don't require um, people to be in person. And you need ways to promote the collaboration, the community, the idea generation, the innovation that can be done remotely. And even if like people are in a local office, let's say you required everyone to come back to the local office, but your company's global still, regardless if they're in the office, many of the people that they are 
working with, they're no longer in their same location and they're working across the country, across the globe. So technology has really picked up to support that that new work environment. Lori, before we go further, I'd like to let our audience know if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan. Our guest today is Lori Maison. She is the author of the book, Leadership Revolution. And Lori, we're going to ask you, is there a website where we can find out more information? Oh, sure. You can go to soundingboardinc.com. Easy enough. And we'll ask you that again. So if someone has wants to jot that down or follow up on that, uh, that'll come up again later in the show. Uh, okay, great. Lori, I really didn't realize how much leaders have coaches like yourself, and you deal with the major, major companies. This is not uh, Joe's Butcher Shop or Ed's Pizzeria or something. So is this something leaders kind of uh, keep in the closet? They don't want to tell people? Or is it known and accepted just like baseball players might have a batting coach or a golf coach might uh, help out, uh, you know, a pro golfer? It's starting to become more accepted. Um, the industry itself only started in the early 90s. And at that time, it really was like this secret weapon uh, only utilized behind closed doors. And that's because one of the early visible coaches, um, their model was helping derailed executives. And nobody wanted to be labeled a derailed executive. So they hired coaches on the side where no one knew um, to make sure that they wouldn't be derailed. So that's how it actually started. In the last maybe 15 years, maybe 20 years or so, people have realized that executive coaching, leadership co coaching is a very accelerated model of development that's personalized for that individual. And so that they really have switched from a, like a remedial approach to a developmental approach. And now the whole push is um, offer this kind of leader development to all leaders in an organization, formal, maybe even informal leaders. So everyone's getting that kind of uh, leader development that used to be reserved for only folks in the C-suite. So it really is, I, I guess, like our sports teams now, we're bringing in more coaches because they're timing how fast the ball goes off the bat, how fast the pitcher pitches, how many pitches, what time of day, if it's the second inning, fourth inning, their style is different, they're getting a little more tired. In, in a sense, I guess management and leadership is doing the same thing. and, and hopefully It is. With, with how, how could you be a world-class class athlete if you didn't have a, a coach so how can you be a world-class leader if you don't have a coach? Now, Laura, you have some great questions, and I love this part. I jotted it down. When you talk to someone, you say, here is where you are now, here is where you want to be, and how do you get there? And if I got that right from your book, so if not, please correct me. But I thought, wow, three, you can't but be more direct than that. You're saying, here you are, there you go, where do you want to be, and how are you going to do it? Um do you shock people with that or do they just look at you like, I have no idea? Sometimes they're shocked. And if they are, then we help them, you know, identify the answers to those questions. More than not, people are relieved to have someone to talk about where they're headed. It was interesting because I actually was trained as a therapist. And when I was doing that in the early days and I had supervision and I would always ask, you know, what have you done differently since the last time we talked? And uh, all the supervision was like, no, you can't ask that. You have to like delve into the past. And I was like, ah, that's not going to work for me. I mean, yes, somebody likes to clear up your past, but I'm the one that likes to help you get to where you want to go in the future. And so when coaching came around, it was a very nice fit for me. And that's ba the basic concept of coaching. It's not fixing up what happened before or handling your, your previous trauma. It's really like identifying the development you need to get to the next place that you want to go to in your career. I, I like that expression. You said as a therapist, you couldn't use it, but what have you done differently? Because it, it really puts us on the line. It's like saying, is this producing? Are you hitting better? Are you catching more passes right. or kicking more field goals or whatever the sports analogy would be? Um, yes. The boss has to come back or leader. And now I'm wondering, when you deal with someone, um, 
How often is this something you do every Monday morning with a particular company in, you know, 52 weeks a year or is it once a month or when needed? Yeah, that interesting. It works better if you have a regular cadence because you can see how it could build over time. If each period of time you're doing something different to help you advance to the next level, that starts to build. So we usually have either a once a week or a once every other week cadence that helps that development kind of stack. There is other styles of coaching might be a once in once in a crisis kind of coaching, but those um, are useful, but not developmental. So you might know from your batting analogy, like if you try something once, that's not going to help you enough for you to bat differently in every game you face. You're going to have to have some development over time. And coaching really has two parts of the development. It has changing how you're thinking about things and then the action that matches that new thinking. So you really have to do both of those. So that takes a process that takes around um, between three months and a year, actually. So you, you, in a sense, and I guess like a good therapist or a doctor of some sort, have to get to know the patient a bit to know what the problem is. Now, do you do this uh, today so much is done by Zoom or does it have to be in person or is it a telephone call? Oh, we actually do it all virtual. So you can do it in person, but because again, the global range of of customers, um, we do it all virtual. And one thing that's very interesting, and it's actually the title of the first chapter in the book is um, on the very first session, we identify what is the big leap for that individual. And you wouldn't think you could identify that in the first session, right? You'd think like, I have to know a lot more about this person to identify that. But you would be surprised that it becomes visible right away in 50 minutes, um, both the person who's being coach and the coach can figure out what the big leap is for the person. Um, About maybe 90% of the time, there's always a few individuals that are tricky and it's a little harder to figure out. But surprisingly, it's quite visible. When you say the big leap, can you give us just a generic example? What do you mean by that? Is it uh, going back to school for the leader or what? Yeah. How do you leap forward in your professional development or how do you leap forward in your role as a leader? Um, in, and it depends on your level. In the early stages, I would say one of the big leaps for many people is around delegation. So if you're like a new manager, there's just a tendency to still try to do everything yourself instead of getting things done you know, through and with your team. Um, at the next level up, there's usually some big leaps around trying to go from just managing a team to managing a department or a group and a lot more folks and being then sort of the manager of managers. So not every person in that group are you having a lot of personal contact with So Then how do you lead that? And then the next level up, you know, the leap usually has to do about, you know, being able to hold the development of the whole organization, you know, in your hands, basically, Um, because now you're an organizational leader and you have to think differently about that than you would if you're a team leader. Now, once you, I guess, decide you've done your job, I'm going to say maybe it's a year's process or something, do the leaders want you around? Because I would think, it's almost a sounding board, like to have somebody near us and you're smiling. And why did I get that big yeah, look? Because that's the name of the company, Sounding Board. Okay, okay, that okay. I didn't realize I fell into that. <laughs> like a sounding board. Then it's, it's well like named. Having a thinking partner. Yeah. Yeah. No, I and I like that term too, thinking partners, because I would feel better if you said yeah. If I came up with an idea and you said yes, now you just kind of validated it. So it's the two of us. And after a year of working with you, I'm assuming I'm progressing along a, a right. progressive chart and making some headway. And now I have your approval. So it, it would seem to me that you know all things are going in the right direction. Uh, well, look- the coach doesn't really give approval because the coach is actually not inside the business. What the coach does is help the leader evaluate that idea. 
and decide for themselves as if it's the right one or not. And do people want it all the time? Yes, they do. <laughs> you know, if you have, like you said, if you get to have that thinking partner or sounding board all the time, likely you will be a better leader and you will make better decisions. But because the approach is developmental, um, we think that it's not continuous for your entire career. Like once you've made your big leap, you may have a period where you're working on that level. And when you need a big leap again, now you hire a coach again to help you get to the next step up. Uh, Laurie, again, before we go further, I'd like our audience to know that you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Horan. Our guest today is Laurie Maison. That's spelled M-A-Z-A-N. Her book is Leadership Revolution. And Laurie, would you tell us the website where we can find out more information? Oh, it's soundingboardinc.com. And if you're interested in this, remember what Lori said, this is all done by Zoom. So if you'd like to know more about it or see how she works, I'm sure if you get on that website, you'll find out more information. Now I'm going to throw a, a situation that came up to me while I was reading your book. Um, you know, sometimes we hear about teachers, they want to move up in the school and um, they, they become a, an administrator and then assistant principal, but they're really a teacher and a really good teacher at heart. Do you ever come across executives who say, wait, maybe I'm kind of one step too far. I was very good at oh. my previous. Oh, you're laughing again. Uh, yes. Yes. That comes up quite often because um, probably like schools, companies often promote people because they were good at their you know, functional role. That doesn't mean they are good as a people manager. And some really smart companies have created two career pathways. Um, because one reason people became managers previously is that's the only way they could advance in the organization. Now organizations will have two pathways. One is people manager pathway. And another pathway is really a functional pathway where they can still have advancement um, because of their, say, technical expertise. And it's not required that they ha uh, become a manager or a leader to get that advancement. A lot of biotechs, pharma, technology companies have that approach. Because you could be like a brilliant scientist coming up with amazing new drugs and really a terrible manager or just not even interested in that. Like you were trained as a scientist with your eye on a microscope, not how to deal with people. And why did you choose that? Because maybe you don't want to deal with people, right? right? Right, no, exactly. And and not everyone can be a manager or a leader. It's just not what everybody wants. Do you ever have to tell someone that, you know, you're kind of sensing maybe they did take that step. And what do they call it? We, we uh, go to the position of our uh, uh, most incompetence or something. Incompetence, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I, um, mostly I, I don't ask them that, but I will ask them like, it doesn't seem like you like this work. Do you really want to be a manager? Right? Do you really want to be the leader of this organization? Um, a surprising number of times people actually don't. They just thought they had to or they didn't want to say no to a promotion, but they're not actually enjoying that role very much. And I think we actually, years ago, we had someone told a story of a doctor who um, really enjoyed his office administration, keeping the records and the accounting, but he didn't enjoy the medical work as much. I, I think his family was mostly business people and he thoroughly enjoyed keeping records, but the, the right. medical part was more secondary. And uh, it, truth be told, that's what he enjoyed in life. So uh, I yes. guess we get our choice. I think like, the distinguisher is people who like to develop others, who see the potential in others, who get a thrill from having a team gel together. Those are the people who really are naturals for management or leadership role. Uh, people who are getting a thrill out of their unique individual contribution, you know, that's maybe not the person that should be promoted into, uh, into a people management role. Now, I, I took a quote out. You said, succeeding in a company is often more how others perceive you. Um, that must be a difficult situation because now the, when you're called in, they're already perceiving this leader in one way or another. 
Um, how do you get that? Do you survey the employees? Do you ask the leader the way that they feel about it? And do, they, do you get a good answer or a truthful one? Oh, we, we actually do both. Um, so there's options. Obviously, the leader we're going to talk to. And then there's options to get feedback, both from direct reports, from peers, and also from your boss as well. Sometimes it's the the little bit the opposite case, like the boss might see potential in an individual that that individual doesn't see in themselves. So it can really go either way. Do you, is there anything on the surface that you do to change perception? Is it either the way they dress or maybe the style of their hair or the, they have a beard maybe to shave or, or just conduct in the office that uh, you, you have to address? You know, in the past, it was a little more that visible behavior because everyone was in person. I did have a client a long time ago who kept getting the feedback that he wasn't working hard enough. And I asked him for his whole schedule of the day. And turns out he was coming to work an hour early and sitting in the cafeteria and having a cup of coffee and reading the the newspaper and everyone thought he wasn't working. Um, so I sense. suggested like, hey, try not doing that and see what happens. And right away, hit the perception changed. But nowadays with remote work, it's not as much exactly how you look and that. It's more how you're, how you're presenting your ideas, how you're working with the team, how collaborative you are, those kinds of things. And so it's more now a capability versus something that's um, an image. Is there a ground rule to know if if the company is hearing this and says maybe I need someone like Lori in there helping us out and doing this, uh, a coach? How do they go about starting the ball rolling? Oh, they should come right to Sounder Board and ask okay. us. We'll help <laughs> them. We partner with companies to um, help them create programs that are going to help their leaders develop. Uh, and, you know, pretty much every company needs this um, because if you're going to have employees who are happy, are happy, you need managers and leaders that are doing well. And these days, people just vote with their feet. If they're not happy with their manager, they just leave and go somewhere else. Uh, Lori, we want to thank you for being with us again to our audience. Our guest today has been Lori Mazan. That's spelled M-A-Z-A-N. Her book is Leadership Revolution. And Lori, give us the website one more time. It's soundingboardinc.com. Okay, easy enough. And take that. a look there. You can have either your personal development through a program we have called Accelerate or your organizational development. We'll help you with both. Sounds great. Lori, thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. I'd like to let our audience know you've been listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan, asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we will continue our journey to success.